Have you been writing bass lines that sound like this? In this video, I'll walk you through my seven steps to writing amazing MIDI bass lines. No matter what kind of music you make, your bass will sound more exciting and more authentic, or how I like to call it, greasy, like this. I just applied all the seven techniques to that initial baseline and turned it into something a lot more interesting, right? If you want to learn how to do that and boost your music production skills, keep watching this video. Hey, how are you? I'm Talis, pop music producer, and today you're going to expand your baseline vocabulary. No more straight eight notes or sustained root notes that last a whole bar. Now, you don't need to use all these techniques at once like I did in the previous example. I myself usually don't, unless I'm going for that funky groove. Sometimes just alternating between the root, third, and fifth note of the chord is enough to make an interesting baseline, but it could be so much better with these seven techniques. Passing notes, syncopation, rest, ghost notes, pitch bends and slides, humanization of timing and dynamics, and chord inversions. For this demonstration, I'll use the native instrument's SCAR-B pre-bass sample library, which has this cool sound of a bass I've been playing for over 15 years. But if you don't have any bass library, you could use a synthesizer or the samples that come with your DAW. It's entirely up to you and the kind of music you make. If you're in Ableton Live, there's this electric bass sampler preset that sounds alright with some equalization. Okay, we'll start with the basics. Say we're working on a simple chord progression like 1, 5, 6, 4, a progression that's perfect for pop music. In the key of C major, that's C, G, A minor, F. Our starting point will be just the sustained root notes that last a whole bar each. That's as simple as you can go with bass lines, and it's played against a straightforward drum loop. The cheesiest drum loop ever, just so we can focus entirely on the bass and make it interesting. Sounds kind of boring, right? Let's add some movement with passing notes. These are notes that will play for a short duration in weak beats or off beats, so they won't draw attention. They won't get any spotlights. It's okay to use notes that don't belong to those chords and even notes outside of the scale of C major, as long as they help connect the important notes which will still play on the strong beats. In this example, I added a D and an E to connect the C on the first bar with the G on the second bar. Then I added a short G sharp, which is a chromatic note it doesn't belong to this scale, but it adds a nice flavor, microtension. It's spicy, and it connects the G to the A. Then there's the C, just for fun, up here by itself, pretending our bass line will keep moving up in pitch, even though the next accented note is the F, way lower in pitch. Here's what it sounds like so far. It already came alive a little, right? Let's add some syncopation now. If you don't know what it means, it's a shift in rhythm where we make off beats or weak beats feel strong by accenting notes on these off beats or weak beats. And the effect is even stronger when we let the note ring over to the next beat. Look at this C right here. Notice how it's kind of a long note and it's not starting on the beat. If it started on the third beat of this bar, it would be around here, but it's starting before on the off beat. Now look at this G. It starts right after the third beat of the second bar on another off beat. And again, on the fourth bar, there's another syncopated note, this F that happens between the second and third beat. This fourth bar actually has a common syncopation pattern called hemiola. If we divide the bar in eight parts, these notes form a three by three by two pattern. This syncopation pattern is all over pop music. Sometimes 
sounds cool, right? What if we let the bass rest between some of these notes? We can come up with a much more interesting groove if we let the notes breathe. So I made some of these notes shorter and if you look at the drums pattern, you notice that I'm letting the kick and snare play by themselves on certain beats. Like here, the bass stops so that the snare can shine and it does it again every now and then. That way we can shift the emphasis in our groove between the bass and the drums. I even removed the bass from the first beat of the third bar. That's a technique called one drop. It's very common in reggae music, which is a style that always gives the bass lines special attention. You may have noticed that some parts became kind of empty. At least I felt that way. But that's on purpose. I left some room for the ghost notes. These are very short, sometimes muted notes that almost turn the bass into a percussive instrument. I like to use them to anticipate the snare and kick, and sometimes it works well right after the kick hits. They add so much to the groove. Some VSTs have a specific MIDI note designed to recreate the sound of a real bass player performing ghost notes, but if you just make the notes short enough, it will work as a ghost note too. I feel like this is already a good enough bass line, but there's more polishing we can do. When I play my bass, I perform slides and bends all the time. It's the natural way of playing, right? So why not do that when programming MIDI bass also? Creating a pitch bend is different in every DAW, but if you're in Ableton Live, you can simply draw it in the clip envelope. Click Envelope tab, MIDI control, pitch bend, and mess with this blue line. You may have to adjust the pitch band range in your instrument to get it to sound precisely how you want it. The sampler had the maximum range of 2 by default, then I made it 12 so I could draw longer slides. Now, as far as bass techniques, that's pretty good already. The next step is humanizing the MIDI pattern. That's what's going to make your bass line really convincing, like a human being playing the bass live, instead of sounding computer made. But before we do that, can you tell me in the comments below what you'd like to learn next? What area of your production do you think you need to improve? If I know how to help you, I'll record a video about it. Alright, humanizing the MIDI notes. First, we'll try to recreate the dynamics of a real player. There's no way a bassist can play all the notes with the same intensity, no matter how good the bassist is, there's always some variation of intensity, and that's easily controllable through MIDI velocity. Before, we had all the notes at 100 velocity, they were all played at the same level. But with some tweaking, you can make some notes sound like they're being played more aggressively than others. I use this to emphasize accents and make ghost notes more noticeable. Go ahead and emphasize the notes you want whatever works for your groove. A basic example of this would be emphasizing the first beat of each bar. And if you're using a good bass patch, the velocity doesn't just affect the volume, but also the timbre. When the bass strings are played with more intensity, we get more of the high mid frequencies. The transient is louder, and even the pitch goes slightly higher since the string is vibrating at a different frequency. You don't want to exaggerate this, especially if you produce pop music like me, because if your bass has too much dynamics, it may disappear in the mix when all the other instruments are super loud and compressed. I like to keep it subtle, but it makes a difference. The next step to humanizing the MIDI bass is by adding slight timing deviations. After all, no bassist can play in perfect timing always. One, two, three, four. Rushing or dragging. So try not to quantize the notes to fit perfectly in the grid. I usually move them around until it sounds like they were played loosely. See how they're not landing exactly on the beats? Another way to do it in Ableton Live is to apply a groove. You can select pre-made grooves from the groove pool and apply them directly to your MIDI or audio clips, and that will affect how your notes are played. In this example, I picked this groove preset called Tom's Pop, and if I click Commit Groove, look at how it changes the placement of these notes. 
I also applied the same groove to the drums so that my bass line would match the drum loop and stay tight. Again, it's a very subtle change visually that makes a lot of difference for the ears. Any bass line that's too straight and landing perfectly on the grid sounds robotic, unnatural and even boring. And the last technique to an awesome bass line is in the realm of music theory. It's the chord inversion, where the bass emphasizes a note other than the root note of the chord, usually the third or fifth note of a given chord. So in this example, on the second bar, instead of playing the G on a downbeat, which is the root note of the G major chord, we're hitting B on the downbeat, and B is the third note of the G major chord. That's an inversion that will change the feeling entirely. Then we play it again later and it lasts longer than most of the notes. So replacing the accent on this one, that's called an agogic accent. And later on bar three, we're going to hit C on the third beat, which is also a strong beat. So we're shifting the focus to C, which is the third note of the A minor chord instead of the root note A. And now that you know the seven techniques to creating captivating bass lines, you can create as many variations as you need. So your song doesn't just loop the same bass line over and over again, because that would be boring. So here's an example, taking the same four bar loop and duplicating it. Now it's an eight bar loop and I made some tweaks so it doesn't repeat itself exactly. The fundamentals are the same, but the notes and timing are slightly different. Alright, now you have all this dangerous knowledge on your hands, you know how to make amazing bass lines and that's a risk. A risk of making all your bass lines too active and attention grabbing. I've done that, it's contagious. That's why you can't leave this video yet. It's important to understand the concept of contrast between the sections of your song. You don't need busy bass lines on every section unless you're making a song like Get Lucky by Daft Punk. But most times having a busy bass line in your verses and a sparse bass line in your chorus, for example, will help your music sound more dynamic and interesting. Going from a simple bass line to a busier bass line according to your song's narrative, will help convey the intended emotions. A bass line that's too hyper with lots of staccato notes and rhythms will cause a feeling of acceleration, maybe more tension, whereas a bass line that relies on longer, sustained legato notes will feel like slowing down or even resolution. This back and forth, this contrast will also keep your listeners engaged. So if you want to take advantage of that, use your bass lines to match the overall feeling of your lyrics and help taking the listener on a journey that I usually call the emotional roller coaster of a good song. Hey, can you subscribe to the channel and turn the notifications on if you learned anything today? Also, I've recorded some videos recently that I think you'd be interested. How to turn any idea into a full song and the best chord progressions for pop music. I'll make them appear on your screen. Thanks for hanging out, I'm Talis and I'll see you on the next one.